Welcome back to the Best of Health podcast. My goal is simple. Each episode, I hope to provide you with insightful conversations with a varied scope of healthcare professionals, clinicians, researchers, functional medicine practitioners, and industry leaders to open up the dialogue to inspire you, the listener, to consider that declining health as we age is not a given, and that with the right information, many chronic diseases are indeed preventable. I hope to engage and inspire everyone to achieve the very best of health. And today we're talking to Humphrey Bacchus. Humphrey is again a dear friend and colleague of mine and Humphrey is the medical director of Invivo Healthcare, which is a company that has a specialist focus on the human microbiome. In vivo offer a range of microbiome testing panels to healthcare practitioners that can be used for you, the client, to assess any microbiome from the oral, the digestive, to the vagina. And the conversation is, as always here on The Best of Health, illuminating. We discuss everything from what type of microbes you can assess for in these varying microbiomes, how microbiomes change through our life stages. And we also talk about different markers that can be incredibly useful in a clinical context, rather than just looking at a lab result. So if you're interested in the microbiome and this journey that we are all beginning to understand that the microbiome is part of our health journey, then stay tuned and listen up to what is an illuminating conversation. So I'm really delighted today to have on the podcast my dear friend and esteemed colleague Humphrey uh, Bacchus. To give you a little bit of an introduction, Humphrey completed his original healthcare training in physical therapy in Boulder, Colorado, which is envious in in of itself. And after graduation, he worked at numerous primary care institutes, including the Mapleton Center for Ortho and Neurological Rehabilitation and the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine. After completing his postgraduate diplomas in clinical nutrition and personalized nutrition, he actually went on to spend a decade in clinical practice in Oxford here in the UK, specializing in chronic GI, gastrointestinal disorders, chronic pain, chronic fatigue syndrome and trauma. He's actually spent the last six and a half, nearly seven years now, committed to understanding complex interactions with the microbiome and our health, as well as host microbiome medicine advances. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have Humphrey here on the podcast. So Humphrey, uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the company that you set up, uh, which is called Invivo Healthcare? and how, as a company, you came to have a specialist focus on the human microbiome. Well, first of all, thank you, Tanya, for inviting me uh, inviting, inviting me to chat to you, and thank you for a wonderful introduction. Um, so the story of Invivo, I think it's a, it's a story of love, of microbes, uh, for sure. Um, I don't think it was a story of love from the outset. I think it's something that's kind of grown incrementally over the years. Um, when I first started uh, in Vivo, we were we were absolutely a, a specialist laboratory company with a huge focus on the gastrointestinal microbiome. You know, eighty percent of our services were focused around understanding the impact that microbes could have on human health and disease. This was back in, I guess, you know, 2010, 2011. Um, that stage, you know, it, it, it was it was definitely an emerging area. You know, some of the early research had really been done in kind of like, you know, the late, late 98, 99, uh, you know, emerging in the early 2000s. But from a kind of commercial understanding and applicability of you know, how you might apply some of the research into clinical practice or certainly put it into the hands of clinicians like yourself, you know, we really started to kind of see 
you know, a lot of roads kind of happen, I guess, in the early 2000s with kind of traditional culture tests uh, and microscopy where you just you know, look for essentially through a microscope and sort of analyze and see whether you can see certain uh, parasites, for example, uh, mm-hmm. that you know, implicate human health and disease. Uh, through to sort of the the, the big advances in um, kind of molecular diagnostics, which really probably a year and a half ago, a year ago, no one knew what PCR was. Uh, you know, in terms of now it's become a common household phrase, you know, better or worse. Um, certainly to some extent, you know, and, and there are you know, huge pros to it and there are obviously some, some cons to that kind of like, you know, technology as well. But if we come back to the, the microbes and in vivo, um, it's really the this understanding of human ecology. It's this understanding that we are indivisible from the environment in which we live. Uh, and, and, and far too much of medicine, you know, that I saw both in the States, even when I, before, when I was kind of working in physical therapy and working in kind of ortho neuro rehab, I'd see patients come in who were, you know, very, almost identical in terms of a physical accident to, to the patient previous. But what was it about them that was not allowing them to get well? And I think this diving down into the stories uh, is really is fascinating. I know it's what you do in clinical practice and starting to kind of understand, you know, patterns of stress, patterns of hormonal changes, uh, sleep-wake cycles, and then kind of delving deeper into what is it fundamentally, you know, about us and how we live. And it's, we, we live in an environment. You know, we yeah. are, you know, as I said, we are indivisible from the environment we live in. And yet it's, it was often not really thought about as being as an important role and factor. And yet the microbes, the fungi, the viruses that live in us and among us, you know, are us. <laughs> they are, you know, they are, they are one of the set, you know, we, 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 we are them as much as we are not them. Um, and so I think it was this kind of understanding, this, this, which pulls together, you know, my love of, you know, gardens and land and soil and ecosystems, um, uh, you know, and people and culture, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of anthropology, it's pulls this all together that kind of made the microbiome such a fascinating, not only subject of science and arena in human health, but something that told a much wider story for me and for the company about, about our relationships with the planet and with, with ourselves uh, and, and with the people that we live with and, and are among. So I think it's the story, not only the science and the impact on human health and disease, but it's the story that these microbes can tell, which is, which is which is which is so lovely absolutely that it's so beautifully put and actually i often when i'm with clients i use the term i describe our ecosystem similar to uh i'm getting to imagine the barrier reef and i say that we want our ecosystems within us to have as much depth and color and shade light and dark and Mm -hmm. it's about explaining the vastness of that of of the ecosystem that 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 is within us uh, to to the layperson, it's sometimes it's so vast. It's some it's very difficult to get our head around. And so y- your terminology of 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 that and your love of the outdoors and nature is such a is such a beautiful segue. Mm. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, and, I, and I I think on that, I think it's such a great mirror. You know, when we look and. You know, I'm not trying to make this too political, but I, but but I think it is. If we look at the degradation of our you know environments, not only in, inside us with the you know proliferation of chronic disease and this increase that we're seeing, um, you know, and particularly lifestyle diseases with the deterioration of the ecosystems and the environments around us. You know, the degradation of soil quality, mm-hmm. forestry, animals, diversity. It directly mirrors that that decrease of diversity that we're seeing in inside us. In terms of this rich ecosystem, uh, so we only have to look up and look around us, really, you know. And, and, and particularly, again, you know, you look at you know these viruses, and, you know, emerging, and the, particularly these, you know, uh, increase in in these kind of zoonotic, you know, kind of all kind of uh, originating in animal type viruses, for example, that have kind of really seen kind of uh, kind of faster appearing in the last twenty years or so. And it, and, and I do truly believe, and I think there are, you know a lot of research around this that says this is this is you know, due to a kind of destruction of our environmental ecosystems so when you come back to us as humans 
looking after this internal ecosystem, looking after these bacteria, looking after these viruses, looking after these fungi uh, is, is absolutely paramount. And I think that's, that sits as the central tenor of everything that we do at InVivo. It's not just about providing the best clinical tests, diagnostic tests for clinicians and, and, and ways to kind of look at this information. Um, but it's also a vehicle to, to talk to people about the importance of it being a mirror to the world in which we live. And I think that's something that's just so close to my heart and something that I can really drive forward in Vivo as well, even though we're, we're a biotech company, you know, we, you know, this kind of this environment and sustainability message and ecosystem is something that sits, you know, just, just as central to what we do as a company. Beautiful, beautifully put. So that really that feeds into the, my my next question in terms of we have microbiomes all throughout our body, not just the gut, which is probably the most well known. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain to our listeners sort of how um, your testing panels uh, stand out maybe from other what commercially available tests? So there are a number out there and just sort of if you can and you mentioned the you mentioned a couple of terms uh, earlier on in terms of pcr mm. so could you maybe just talk to that a little bit and explain what those terms mean please yeah absolutely so uh, you know we we're a microbiome company that's all we do uh we kind of you know believe that you know to, to really try and be the best at something it's it, it's important to kind of like have a, a focus area on something that you love and, and, and an area that you can have a large impact on so quite rightly as you mentioned tanya you know it doesn't stop with the gut microbiome which is you know such a, a big exploding area you know even i was in waitrose at the weekend and i saw you know gut health drink containing a bacillus coagulans for example you know and an apple juice and i was just thinking wow it really is you know kind of like you know start, starting to shift and change um people's perception you know and, and, and not being kind of scared of the gut and, and bacteria but it expands, you know, right out, as you mentioned, um, you know, we we have a test that analyzes the microbial communities in the vaginal microbiome. Yeah. Uh, we look at the oral microbiome as well. Uh, we have lots of, we have our own lab in Bristol uh, with an R&D facility, and we're looking at all sorts of other different microbiomes as well, uh, and the impact right. that they have on, on health and disease. Um, but critically, the most important thing is how how do you make it practically applicable? Yep. This is, uh, you know, there are lots of tests out there, you know, uh, in a research arena. So yes. as you mentioned, you've got um, kind of old methodologies, I, I suppose, which are the traditional culture where you, you see if you can grow a specific, specific species in a specific medium, kind of like watch it grow on an agar plate, or you can look through a microscope and see if you can identify certain you know, parasites, for example. And that became sort of superseded to some extent by this molecular approach where you're looking for particular gene sequences um, which is what the PCR test is for, uh, you know, RNA virus, you know, which they're doing at the moment for, for COVID-19 or different variations. Mm -hmm. um, and so identifying what you can see. So you take a, you know, you take some saliva or you take a vaginal swab or you take a piece of fecal matter and you extract the DNA, you extract the kind of the, you know, the DNA of, um, uh, from that uh, sample type, uh, uh, you, you you clean it you and then you you analyze it and you look at how much of any specific species um you can find uh now we know so little in some respects mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so i think it's always really important just to add this is you know there's there's no point in just presenting information for information's sake and uh, you want to be able to provide enough that someone in the hands of the right person, they could take that information and they can hopefully with context and pattern that is provided within the results with a health history, with all these other, you know, considerations, you know, lifestyle considerations, you can start to piece together, you know, a story again, you know, what is the story of the microbes? You know, what, why are certain microbes there? Why might you have missing microbes? I think this is a really fascinating area, the, this area of, why some species might not be present rather than looking for the ones that are present. Um, different ecosystems uh, in the gut microbiome, you want huge diversity. You want as many kind of different species really, you know, uh, uh, you know, as possible. In the vaginal microbiome, you want as little diversity as possible. Uh, so really understanding that each 
each environment is unique, each microbiome is unique and niche. Um, and, and that's what, you know, that's what we spend our, you know, our days and our time doing is, is understanding, understanding these ecosystems and, and trying to put it into a context that is applicable. Even within the molecular world now, we have the ability to sequence down, I talk about sequencing, so to look at not just an individual species or a group of species, but to kind of go down into the minutiae of um, what's present within a specific sample. But to do that, we always have to ask ourselves, how can you make it clinically applicable? Right, I'm going to how can you apply it? So the challenge is not just presenting just huge, large amounts of data, mm -hmm. really can't say anything. Um, and then for the clinician, how on earth are they going to get their head around, or even for the patient, just the, just the vast amount of information and difficulty in even pronouncing some of the names of some of the bacterial yeast or fungi that that you're that you're presenting on. Um, so at the moment, though we have the capacity at the lab to do this sort of this deep sequencing or shotgun sequencing or doing the kind of the targeted PCR testing, which is just choosing the very specific microbes that we want to measure. Uh, right now that's what we choose to do because we we believe that it gives gives the individual enough information not too much information and enough information to be able to make a decision as to what to do next or or, or which microbes might be specifically impacting damage to their mucosal integrity within their gut you know that kind of barrier between the inside world and the outside world or specific microbes that might be impacting the progression of inflammatory bowel disease yep. or we yep. choose microbes that specifically impact or feed on a very high kind of bio or, or, or high fat diet for example yes we kind of like take the research we digest it down and we try and create a panel that has almost mini panels within it to some yep. extent it's a little groupings of microbes, yep. but at the same time, that um, but at the same time, we also want to create a panel where you can zoom out and get a glimpse of this ecosystem. There's Absolutely. no, and I think just to, there is no, there is no, there is no perfect test. You know, there's the kind of there's the kind of you know there's, there's always this balancing act between what do you measure, how do you present it, um, and and how do you make it applicable? And and I hope and I and I believe just from and what we've seen in you know of, of how um you know our ecologics panels the vaginal and the oral and the, and the gut panel have been taken up you know within this you know this marketplace that they are really practical clinical tools that um that people are able to use to really get insight into into these micro not only the microbes but this host what what are we as humans and how are we responding to to these microbes Absolutely. And that last sentence or that last statement is is absolutely key for us to consider. And actually, as as, as Humphreys, I've been using these tests since they're uh, since they came to market. And absolutely the 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 way that they are presented and the way that we can overlap you, the client, you, the patient's story to to that rather than we don't treat the lab result it's about um, it's about weaving the your case history uh throughout the result to actually help to uh to help to, to bring together the most appropriate treatment plan for for you mm -hmm. and, and having this data as confirmatory uh picture telling if you like of of, yeah. of, the, of the roadmap which mm -hmm. is yeah it's absolutely. I think you're right. It's you know, there's a, there's a challenge, and I think looking at microbes in isolation is is sometimes useful, but also a dangerous game. You know, even this this idea. You know, we talk about it's um, this idea of like let's stop naming and shaming microbes. You know, and I think this is something that you know we're we're, we're even seeing. You know, sort of see even you know seeing even more this year. You know, with, you know COVID nineteen as as a virus. Um, you know, some might argue, is it is it strictly pathogenic if it doesn't cause illness in all individuals? You know, or is it completely asymptomatic? And the same could be said of many microbes, you know, that you that you have within your ecosystem kept in balance and kept in check by other microbes or the health of the host. Mm -hmm. well, that doesn't become pathogenic. It doesn't cause illness. And so therefore, 
this kind of red flagging certain microbes that you need to treat in every single instance is is a bit is a bit dangerous and it, i think it plays into this kind of singular cause and effect paradigm that we have in medicine yes i think that probably also is a reticence of of kind of um not engaging with the microbiome and i'm sure tanya as you know one of kind of the most you know m- my favorites as scientists carl Vos, uh you know very famous microbiologist you know who was instrumental in really helping us to understand kind of uh you know the phyla and the kind of the tree of life um really says that we need to start sort of embracing the complexity of biology rather than shying, shying away from it and i think it's this sort of almost learning learning and loving this idea of bathing in the complexity and sort of enjoying it rather than kind of finding it fearful is really important uh and there's a kind of there's a, there's a beauty there's a beauty in the complexity and there's a beauty in the stories that can be told rather than this uh idea that oh well we see this microbe being high you know and i, and I see it on forums and it, and it really worries me i see you know i see it on forums all throughout all around the world I, you know i kind of follow the mapping of the microbiome and the people say oh you know i see citrobacter frindii you know and it says hi on my result okay you know i'm gonna start chasing it and then i'm gonna start chasing it i'm gonna treat it with you know a herb that i've read in one single murine study has an impact on reducing citrobacter and they've completely forgotten about the rest of the ecosystem yeah absolutely. and, 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 and w- what is happening in the host is there inflammation you know what's you know what's, what's pancreatic function doing you know is there any elevation of you know kind of uh, any other indicative markers that that, that that show that there's an elevated immune function i mean what what so again it's this taking something out of context which is um something actually you know throughout life i think that you know we can, we can learn a lot from the microbiome we really can and actually i think what you've just said i think this last year has we've taken a big step back in terms of it's really polarized that way of thinking of naming and shaming and instilling fear and it's so in our world that it really has we've sort of taken a a step back because fear has come to the forefront and so that leads me on to sort of a, a big part of one of the keystone panels that in vivo uh, that in vivo does is called the gi ecologics yeah um, and it is beautifully presented in a very clinically relevant, it's put into, as you've just said, little mini stories, little mini areas. And so for any anyone listening who isn't a practitioner, your practitioner will be able to guide you through this very visually and, 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 and weave in your story and bringing in sort of what you've just, you just said before about what other areas can we look at in terms of the the health of the overall host rather than naming and shaming individual microbes so there are some really key um key markers that you that you do and you spoke about mucin and barrier functions could we there are two that you that actually are i think probably my all-time favorite <laughs> uh, secretory iga and, and beta defense in too so could you talk to and explain what those are to our listeners absolutely so i think it's it's really important to kind of talk a little bit about you know kind of this interaction between the host host and the microbes or the kind of a uh, host you know the human health you know the microbes in this kind of there's a there's a mucosal barrier everywhere where where this where this happens so in the oral cavity for example there's a mucosal barrier in the lungs uh in the vagina uh, you know in the nose in in the gut you know it's this kind of uh this barrier between the outside world and the inside world mm-hmm. and you want to have a barrier it doesn't want to be too thick it doesn't want to be too thin you want to have a bit of transport you want community this is kind of almost where the communication happens it's where this sort of microbial Crosstalk storytelling, uh, you know, we've chatted about this loads. It's kind of this. We have yeah, the, the the nattering of the microbes with the immune system. Yep. And this signalling of kind of the the microbes telling us what to do. And uh, it was really interesting. I was chatting to a, uh, uh, a very kind of uh, pronounced, you know, um, microbiologist the other day. He was really talking about the virome, and actually, probably what we'll find out in. You know, and what's emerging is that probably actually the viruses are t- probably telling the bacteria what to do 
is that we think it's bacteria, but actually there's, you know, there's a kind of whole another thing kind of, you know, happening all in this soup, this, 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 it's, it's a bacterial soup. It kind of all interacts, you know, in this kind of, you know, mucosal layer, this kind of mucosal epithelium. And, and we, we have some markers, which again are not, they are indicators. They're little kind of, they're signposts. They're not diagnostic markers. They are signposts that give us a window of information that allows us to really see how what, what is what is the health of this you know this integrity this you know this with this mucosa integrity so we have secretory IgA which is produced from the mucosal epithelium mm -hmm. uh, it's a uh, IgA it's uh, uh, an immune peptide uh, immune signaling uh, you know barrier defense molecule um, and we want we want there to be you know some in, in very high levels when we see elevations of this secretory IgA it's often in acute infections yep. in response to an infection and then we also know that in, in periods of chronic stress for example uh, prolonged stress or prolonged chronic infection or, or uh, even just down to kind of massively dis disrupted circadian rhythms or sleep wake cycles for example this this secretory IgA can really drive down and it, and it reduces our defense system. Uh, against the outside world and and we have the same in the oral cavity as well you know this secretory iga um and so we so we look at that and then we also measure um uh, an antimicrobial what's called an it gets a bit complex an antimicrobial peptide uh called beta defense in so in really this is just a uh, as it says an antimicrobial so it's an antimicrobial protein which is stimulated it's the body the the microbes all the kind of the commensal microbes, the kind of the healthy beneficial microbes um, that are in the gut will tell the body to produce this anti antimicrobial, when, when, it's almost like an intruder alert. It's sort of, sort of saying, okay, there's something that we don't want here, for example. And so all the microbes start chatting away and they tell the body, hey, you know, we need to produce some of this like beta defensive. Um, so it kind of like kicks it into production. But if there isn't enough of the commensals, if there aren't enough of these healthy bacteria, in the gut, you can't tell, hasn't got, hasn't got the, you know, the, the power to be able to tell the body that this needs to be put into production. So again, you get like a, you get a, you've got a, a depleted immune response uh, to a kind of external invader or something that it, the body doesn't really want to be close to, uh, or a microbe. Or it can go the other way, which is it can become an uh, over exaggerated response. Uh, or not over exaggerated, but in response to an infection. So often we see really high levels of beta defense in, in correlation with inflammatory markers in conditions like IBD, or even in kind of like, you know, chronic IBS cases, and then it gets really high in parallel with inflammation in IBD. So again, it's just a really, it's a nice marker to look at in combination with the microbes. You can't look at it in isolation. Completely. Yeah, and that's like any of the markers, you don't look at any of them really in isolation. You need to, okay, so this is elevated. Why is it elevated? What's happening with the microbes? What's happening with the patient in front? What are they experiencing? Uh, and does it make sense? I think that's one thing that we, you know, does, you know, does, does what we see make sense to us in terms of what we know? Um, yeah. That's just on those two markers are, that's a kind of, again, it's, it's just a little bit of a window into not only what's happening with the microbes, but what's happening in this kind of immune defense realm. Absolutely fantastic. And the, the word when you say a window, that's exactly that is exactly how all of your panels uh, can be viewed mm -hmm. is that no pun intended is that the the story and the, the subcategories within your panels do help to tell the story and they help to open up windows in the in within the house of each individual. And it, it is about sort of uncovering that as you go. Yeah, and I just the other thing I'll just add to that is, is sometimes you don't, you, you know, sometimes you you look at what's not there, uh, or or you can look at what's good and it can then point you to other systems in the body. It's not all about the microbiome, you know, as you know as well. And I think that's something that sometimes we can make assumptions that every, you know, everything is, you know, but actually. Again, the microbiome might be impacted, but that might point to dysregulation elsewhere. It's not necessarily, it's always the driving cause. It can be the effect of something else that's happening as well. So again, you know, we, we, we just need to be aware and that's why we, you know, we need to be open-eyed really about and open-minded about 
you know, has the microbiome become dysbiotic as a, as a result of other things? It's not necessarily that the microbiome has driven the, the you know the pattern elsewhere, for example. Absolutely, and the way that so you so we have this this the body is completely connected and the gastrointestinal tract runs all the way through us but as Humphrey just illuminated so beautifully one marker the secretory IgA the the sort of the the, the part of the barrier mm. it is a surveillance mechanism and so therefore that surveillance mechanism is communicating through microbes and through other systems to and other surveillance mechanisms, the nervous system, the neuroendocrine system. And so there is this, this chatter uh, across the entire body, which is. Yeah, I was, I was just, it just may suddenly made me think, Tanya, around one of the misconceptions, which I'm not sure if you want me to jump into this, but misconceptions around probiotics, which is, which is really that probiotics, you know, people have a, a perception that probiotics are somehow re-inoculating or they're somehow repopulating the kind of the gut microbiome, which we now really know not to be true at all. Probiotics are immune signaling molecules. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are, they're creating communication pathways. They're telling, they're, they're passing messages, which is why specific strains, specific species might work with some individuals, not with others, why some work with some conditions, because they're communicating in a very specific way. But it's not that you're putting lots of microbes in and suddenly you're kind of colonizing them all and you know everything's everything's happy. It's the it's the metabolites, the uh, post metabolites really of the microbes once you've ingested them and they pass through that start signaling that kind of talk to these this the host, you know the neuroendocrine you know pathway or the gut brain axis for example. And I think this is really important because often again you're looking at you're picking up bottles and going, oh, you know, it used to be this idea that bigger is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, I'm taking 500 billion CFU of, you know, probiotics. And it's like, yes, I'm getting it. But actually, you know, now, I mean, I've seen, you know, some, and again, these are the animal studies, but, you know, it's kind of like, you know, 1 billion of some bacterial kind of post-metabolites, you know, has a, a massive impact on kind of vaginal inflammation, for example. Very, tar very targeted, um, you know, kind of probiotics. So I think it comes into this idea that, you know, probiotics, you need to understand what you want to achieve before you start using it. You know, it's no different to going to a hardware store, you know. You know, you can walk, you walk in, you've got all these different sores. It's like, well, what kind of job do you want to do? You know, yeah. there, there, isn't, there isn't like this kind of like, yes, there are some kind of like, you know, there's a, you know, general, you know, wood saw, for example, but are you doing fine tuning work or do you need to actually uh work with metal actually you suddenly realize or do you what what is the job to be done and i think the question always needs to be what is the job to be done and also what you've what you've said is so there's two things there some people might not know what a metabolite is so a metabolite is essentially a breakdown product yeah. of, um and also what humphrey was is, is saying is also is the it's actually the environment that you're putting this we're talking about probiotics that you're putting that into so it's it's the the person walking into a hardware store but actually what are the staff like what is their previous knowledge of purchasing a saw yeah how helpful are they going to be how helpful are the staff going to be yeah. amenable to you having a conversation with them yeah. you, know, it's yeah. like you don't want to walk into a hostile you know like territory and and i think that's that's really important so a lot of what you're doing in clinical practice is making the body more receptive it's making it more receptive, making it more receptive you know Absolutely. and it's, it's the softening of the of the of the you know the kind of the battlefield really kind of like yeah. one, you know and, and you know we know what a huge role kind of even things like trauma have to that as well it's just like you know it, it's very difficult to be receptive when we're in a fight or flight mechanism completely so it's just it's this softening and, and making this making a really receptive vessel like and again it's about bringing the, the human body and the microbes together in harmony it's not about creating a conflict yeah. uh, uh you know it's not it's not a battle it's, it's just not a battle and i think that's that's probably if, if i could you know it's still anything you yeah. know it's not a battle against the microbes we need yeah. to love them more rather than you know battle them yeah lovely mm. Uh, so I'm mindful of time, and I would like to just touch on two other areas, if if I may. 
Uh, you, you've you mentioned, but you do have two other microbiome panos, the oral and the vaginal. Can you uh, explain a little bit about how, I mean, it might be obvious, but let's just sort of dig into those a little bit in terms of when, or where you found those to be helpful. So I know particularly yeah. the vaginal one has been very helpful with clinicians that work in fertility, but if you could talk yeah. about that a little bit. So I think, first of all, all ecosystems have a, a local and a, and a systemic effect. So mm -hmm. gut, for example, a lot of people would imagine that you only do a gut test, test if you have gut symptoms, mm. you know, and of course, really helpful with IBS or IBD or post colorectal cancer or, you know, like there's a whole myriad of different conditions that you might want to think about working with the gut, but obviously it has impact on gut brain axis or hormone regulation or, you know, uh, and the same with the oral and the, and the vagina. So the oral cavity, obviously the microbes have a, have a huge role to play in things like periodontitis, for example, um, or, you know, oral uh, thrush uh, or, um, you know, abscesses or, I mean, anything kind of like orally related, which is that local. But then we need to think about the systemic aspects and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, probably the, the, the largest impact in terms of studies has been the impact that your oral health, your oral health has on cardiovascular disease. You know, that's probably where it's kind of like most well now known. But actually, you know, even one of our scientific advisory board members, Dr. Victoria Sampson, has been doing a really fantastic study for, uh, or completed a very good study on the oral microbiome and COVID-19 outcomes and severity. Uh, with King's College London, or you could look at the impact of the oral microbiome and, and, and a, a bad or dysbiotic or kind of imbalanced oral microbes and neurodegeneration or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Yeah. So again, you kind of think thinking about this local, but thinking about systemic mm -hmm. uh, and the way that the oral, you think how much saliva you're swallowing every single day as well, and how much kind of like you know immune signaling molecules or microbes you're swallowing that kind of like pass them into the gut. There's definitely an oral gut uh, connection. And then coming to the vaginal microbiome, I mean it's um, it's a niche it's a niche microbiome that has mm -hmm. a huge role to play. It again it has a barrier function, has a you know vaginal epithelium, um, hormones hugely affect. Uh, you know, through the hormonal cycle of the month, for example, and the, the rising of estrogen and, the, and, and then the fall of it, for example, you know, influences the pH uh, of the vagina and where you've been brought up. Uh, your sexual partners, for example, will all impact the different microbes that you'll find within, you know, the vaginal microbiome. And also the life stage of the, wo the woman as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right the way through to postmenopause. Correct, exactly. And so therefore, but what we often see is, again, you don't have to necessarily have to have an, an overt infection for there to be an impact. And often, particularly, you quite rightly named it as well, Tanya, what, what, what we see is, is one area that, you know, become very interested in, we're doing a lot of work with people uh, working in fertility, which is the, the impact of an imbalanced sort of microbial community within the vagina or an overgrowth of certain species, for example, an underrepresentation of uh, lactobacilli species or, uh, you know, high pH, uh, which doesn't allow these really beneficial microbes to thrive, leads to there being more opportunity for, again, it's this kind of this balance. It's like, you know, when, you, when the environment changes, other more detrimental microbes can move in and that can then, you know, hinder uh, there being a kind of a, a, favorable, a, a more favorable environment, really, which is, again, we're talking about this environment and we want to create an optimal, most favorable environment for, you know, all life to occur, you know, Absolutely. particularly. And, that, and that's kind of, that's why we kind of like focused on these three microbiomes and the impact they have uh, for the people that are using them in, in practice. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and there is another fantastic, fantastic example of the, our microbes, performing a surveillance mechanism the ultimate surveillance mechanism in terms of being the ripe environment or a favorable environment for optimal fertility so i think it is a, a, a fantastic tool um, in vivo also has developed a, a really stunning range of therapeutics to sort of to complement your ethos which hopefully i'm sure has really shone through today in terms of your ethos um and we'll i'm sure we'll get you back on the podcast to talk about these in more depth but 
just to start today's conversation uh, around your bio.me range, which is so topical. And there is, when you very first launched it, you described there was this, uh, like a, it's like a flower effect and you have a, a keystone product called Biome Essential, which could you just talk to our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, so again, it comes it comes back to the host, doesn't it? it it's about it's like how how do we how do we create a favourable environment? And there'd always been so much talk, um, you know, about probiotics and prebiotics. And then when we really started digging into the literature. We were thinking, well, you know, what, what is it for the microbiome to be healthy? And, and um, really started reading a lot more around these polyphenols, which I'm sure most of your listeners have you know have heard about. You know, kind of. Uh, come from different tannins, come from different plants and fruits, whether it's pomegranate or citrus or, or uh, grapefruit or, you know, polyphenols from different, pl different, different plants, really. Mm -hmm. And these are in and of themselves, do I describe them as, they're not fertilizers, they're not weed killers. They are almost, if you think in kind of garden terms, creating, you know, just really favorable soil conditions. So they're not a fertilizer, they're, but they're, they're making the the best place in order to plant the seeds. Yep. Uh, and that's what, you know, Biome bio Essential, why we called it there. So it's very rich, you know, in these polyphenolic compounds, which have a really, really favorable for uh, creating a, you know, healthy gut microbiome. Uh, and it's definitely in addition, and they always are in addition to obviously the, the, the food and dietary interventions that we can make on a daily basis. You know, around, you know, at the dinner table, you know, to see some of your your post Tanya, and you know, particularly that richness and diversity of color. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at, you know, what's in what's in the Biome Essential. It's it's very similar, but it's just very standardized, kind of like high concentration of specific compounds, uh, which we know from the research literature and human studies has has had a, a you know huge impact on things like inflammation, for example. Um, and then it's rounded out with some nervine, so it's rounded out with we talked about the nervous system. We just mentioned about such a massive, you know, proponent of, of talking about the impact of the nervous system on, on the gut microbiome and on our whole system health. So things like lemon balm, chamomile, uh, you know, some ashwagandha in there as well. Again, not only do they act, you know, in kind of polyphenolic, you know, application of kind of helping to create a favorable bed in order to kind of plant these, you know, prebiotic and probiotic, uh, you know, compounds, but also, just for calming the nervous system so it's really just thinking about yeah how can we how can we how can we feed the gut and the microbes with these favorable you know phytonutrients that will really create a, a wonderful environment in all the plant seeds great thank you and the from a many of you listening may be may be thinking i know everybody's telling me to eat a diverse diet and to get all the colors in, but you may well be in a situation that you can't because you can't in speech marks, if you could see me, uh, tolerate that you, you've, you struggle to be able to consume that variety of, of color right now. So, so in lay terms, this is sort of really, this product is providing those colors for you uh, in a capsule form, uh, you I wouldn't advise opening it because because they're bitter because they're herbs they are very bitter that's the their action, yeah. um, but also the the nervine component is very good at is are uh, elegantly able to calm the 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 nervous system and of course work on the that the the highway that runs between the two which is the vagus nerve so there are i mean there are many other routes but it is a a lovely product that that helps to be able to, to thinking tanya as you, as you were saying that as well i was just thinking that it's in conjunction with you know and i think that you know the kind of you know the dietary aspects as well i mean i saw you've seen it in clinical practice a lot is is you know sometimes it's just not possible to get you know the standardization or the levels for example of a very specific you know citrus fruit extract for example that's been shown to decrease calprotectin levels for example in human clinical trials or you know a very specific kind of aronia berry extract uh, which has been shown to kind of uh, you know in inhibit certain growth of certain bacteria or kind of and i think that's where it comes down to it's it's sort of almost like plant medicine 
uh, you know, in, in some ways to kind of way, you know, to think about it or certainly, you know, ways, as I said, you know, where you might want to call it medicine, but it's certainly kind of using, using, using kind of very kind of standardized kind of, you know, botanicals uh, for very specific purposes. Yeah. You know, it all has a place. And I think this is where this kind of comes back to this conflict. It's, it's not trying to carve out anyone's righter than anyone else or everyone or some people are more wrong it's you know there's a the right time and a place for the utilization of the testing you know for the products for diet for the pharmaceutical interventions you know all of that the, the, it, it all it all has its right time and right place it does and and everything evolves and we are right in the center of that and the way that we work the way that we work and the way that we practice and the way that we view a result and the way that we advise our clients is all it all evolves and this is part of that part of that picture part of that dialogue absolutely great humphrey it's been an absolute pleasure i think that's a really nice way to round off our conversation today and uh and as i sort of started by saying you've been a, a dear friend and a sort of a colleague in this world for many years so i hope that you will come back on the podcast and continue the journey with me and my listeners and thank you so much for your time. And we will put in the show notes how anyone can get in touch with uh, In Vivo to be able to use their to be able to use their products. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you.